Hello, this is Adam Carroll. I'm the Burma Task Force Team Lead at Justice for All and also serving as the point person at the United Nations. Um, Justice for All has been working since, well, it's nine years at least. Uh, we've been working on uh, the issue of the Uyghur uh, and the uh, Kashmir and the Indian minorities and all the persecuted minorities, um, but above all on the Rohingya genocide. And in Burma, this is what first drew our attention. However, one year ago, on February 1st, 2021, the same Burmese military that perpetrated genocide against the Burmese Muslim minority also perpetrated a military coup, bringing down uh, the government of Aung San Suu Kyi, the national, uh, the NLD government, and beginning a year long crisis uh, with increasing violence, uh, thousands arrested, killed, bombings, most recently uh, the Christmas Eve massacre, plenty of war crimes. And these acts of brutality arise from a, as part of a pattern. The Tatmadaw, the name of the Burmese military, uh, has been in power uh, for many decades. And our expert speakers today will be reflecting on the patterns and the uh, the lessons, perhaps. Will their analysis inform actions? Will we be able to better understand how to confront the Burmese military, uh, who are very much still in control despite a very brave and determined resistance by most Burmese and a very diverse and fragmented country. Increasingly poor, increasingly in crisis, also facing COVID pandemic uh, problems. And so, you know, what are the possibilities for Burma in the next year? Will we see a victory for democracy and for the forces of democracy. It's going to be quite a struggle. And uh, so we have today um, two experts and perhaps we'll be joined by a third. Uh, we're going to start with Dr. Roger Lee Wang, uh, lecturer on terrorism studies and political violence at Macari University. And please correct me if I'm mispronouncing anything. Uh, he has broad research interests in the politics, international relations, and security of East and Southeast Asia. He has previously worked in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, and interned with the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime in Yangon, Burma. He's the author of The Paradox of Myanmar's Regime Change. And then after Roger, we'll have uh, Dr. Rushta Siddiqui, primarily a freelance social science researcher and human rights activist working on gender comparative international politics and development. Rushta is formerly associate fellow at the Institute for Defense Studies and Analyses in New Delhi, currently an executive committee member of the National Federation of Indian Women, she is managing the research and advocacy units of the Federation's Delhi unit. So welcome both of you. And uh, Dr. Uh, Roger Li Wang, please go ahead. Uh, thanks for inviting me to the show. So as uh, most of you will be aware, of course, um, following the February 1st coup d'etat last year, where the uh, Tatmadaw, the Myanmar military, has uh, once again reasserted its dominance and absolute control of this data. Apparatus. But quickly to uh, correct myself, it has attempted to return absolute military rule. But now, uh, 11 months in, almost a year since the coup, you can see that the military has not prevailed as it probably had assumed it would have when it launched the coup. Now, um, really, Myanmar is now in a very intense, uh, heated situation. Um, there is political violence throughout the whole country. 
Um, where even though there has been uh, about seven, well, ever since Myanmar got its independence in 1948, there's been ongoing ethnic and other uh, communist insurgencies against the government. We have not seen the type of scale of this type of violence for about two decades, and now that has returned. Um, in addition to the old armed ethnic organizations, you have a lot of new militia groups that has formed up. And much of this is uh, these new groups are a direct reaction against the brutality of the Tatmadaw, this, this uh, military hunt, uh, junta. So these people's defense force, large majority of them having pledged their allegiance essentially to the parallel uh, shadow government, the uh, NUG, the National Unity Government, which is largely um, staffed by uh, parliamentarians and other uh, politicians and uh, democratic leaders, uh, most of them from the National League for Democracy, that is the, the most popular uh, pro-democracy party in the country, but also some ethnic leaders and ethnic groups have joined this coalition. Um, and there are also a lot of complexities to this, so I'll try my best to, to make it um, cl as clear as possible. But this People's Defense Force that I've just mentioned is also just a loose coalition of different militia groups. So there are groups that might um, have more direct interaction with the older ethnic armed organizations. They might have some uh, direct interaction with the national unity government, but a lot of them are also kind of independent militia groups that not only please their allegiance, but are run as essentially by local leaders you know, in, in the different townships and villages and whatnot. And also there is a few key paradigm shifts that I would like to mention and talk about. So to kind of see what has changed in Myanmar. Right, you have a country that has seen uninterrupted uh, ethnic insurgencies against the state, against the government, whether it's um, in the early stages of pre, uh, 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 the early stages of independent Burma that was against the uh, the authorities, uh, the elected authorities, in fact, and then later against the military regime. Now, this new paradigm shift today is that one, we've always assumed that Hatmadaw as being this infallible key uh, institutional figure that uh, has uh, almost absolute dominant over society. And that hasn't changed too much in the sense that, yes, the military remains to be the most capable with the most resources and most centralized power. But at the same time, the inability of the military to convince the people to lay down arms, the inability of the military to convince civil servants to come back to work. Uh, I should ask that right after the coup, there was a massive uh, civil disobedience movement, which was actually led by civil servants, right? Where they refused to go back to work, where uh, train workers, hospital, hospital doctors and nurses, uh, educators in schools, all of these people refused to go back to work. And even now, 11 months on, yes, uh, military has used uh, different coercion and incentives to encourage them to come back, but there is still a lot of uh, civil servants that have continued to hold out. So we have now exposed, or really the, the opposition, the anti-military opposition has exposed the fallacy of the military that it doesn't have the type of control that in the vision it has. Despite their military superiority, it has not been able to uh, silence uh, urban guerrilla fighters in, in central Burma, as well as against the ethnic armed groups. Now, another big paradigm shift that, if I have time, I want to mention is also how the opposition has changed. Now, um, many people sh would be aware that even though Myanmar was technically undergoing some sort of democratic transition since 2011, I have always emphasized that Myanmar has never generally democratized, that even when Aung San Suu Kyi and the National League for Democracy won the election in, back in 2015, 2016, that this was, uh, as per the constitution written by the military, a disciplined democracy. So it wasn't a democracy that we, uh, most uh, people were familiar more with the liberal uh, Western democratic style of governance as a genuine democracy, because the military still continue to hold on uh, several levels of power. And beyond that, Aung San Suu Kyi and NLD weren't the best examples of liberal Democrats when they had some control over policies and government between 2016 until the coup. Um, of course, uh, given the linkage to this network, most of you would be aware that Aung San Suu Kyi was no friend of the Rohingya populace, obviously, and wasn't even sympathetic to a large majority of the ethnic minority groups in their uh, decades of grievances against the military and, and, and to some extent also against the Bama, kind of the main Bama ethnic groups chauvinism. But that has changed again. That is the second kind of key paradigm shift I want to talk about, which is that now 
the national unity government and those kind of the uh, anti-regime uh, and the broader Burma population have recognized that, in fact, they have been fed and believe a lot of the military propaganda. Um, now, uh, there are especially younger generation, what we refer to as the Gen Z, those that were really at the initial forefront of the civil disobedience movement. They have come up publicly apologizing for their behavior against Rohingya, uh, their uh, behavior against some ethnic minority groups. And NUG has also technically released the, the statement, I think, uh, several months back, saying they are going to basically uh, revoke the 1982 citizenship law, which uh, basically made Rohingya and other uh, large other minority groups uh, stateless in Myanmar. So they have now changed their position. Um, in many ways, uh, I think it is a way to try to convince the broader international community to support them. But I think there is some genuine soul searching now that they are seeing a type of uh, physical uh, violent cohesion, uh, co co coercion that the military is dealt in to the Bama people. So they now recognize that, in fact, perhaps the Rohingya really were the victims that they have always claimed to be, and that there is some soul searching um, needed there. But I also don't want to oversell that uh, before I run out of my time, that there is still some resistance even within the NUG and, and kind of the uh, pro-democracy movement, who are still reluctant to go all out to actively embrace um, uh, these minority groups, which they have for decades been uh, basically demonized as the other. Um, I, I don't know if, um, if I should add anything else, or should I give my time to uh, Dr. Roshnu Siddiqui? Yes, uh, before I uh, we pass it over to Dr. Uh, Roshnu, I did want to ask you two questions. Um, one is, um, one year ago, why did the military do this when Aung San Suu Kyi was fairly compliant, it seemed. Uh, why was, did they think this was necessary? Is it something in the nature of the hierarchy of the Tatma Dao? Um, and then my other question is, I, you did work in Burma, and I was wondering if your work on drug and other criminal enterprises also gave you a window on some of the corruption of the Tatma Dao. Yeah, so for the, the why question, I think that's the million dollar question, right? Everyone is asking why. Um, a lot of the uh, political scientists and others that have followed Myanmar closely were uh, somewhat surprised, right? The 2008 constitution that was basically uh, drafted, written, and implemented by the military uh, allowed this disciplined democracy, right? And as I've kind of briefly mentioned, when Aung San Suu Kyi and NLD uh, came into uh, semi-power, where they shared a uh, for enforced coalition government with the military between 2016 and 2021, um, they often sided with the military, right? Aung San Suu Kyi personally went to La Hague to defend uh, against the, Gambia, the Gambia's charges against the Myanmar state of uh, genocide against Rohingya. Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and NLD uh, supported the military's action against the Arakan army in the Rakhine state, etc. And they were also not, no friends, uh, the, the NLD civilian government, that is, they were not real friends of the media. So again, so what? Why, why has the military done this? Why has it shut, uh, shut its own foot when they designed this disciplined democracy system then just to overthrow it? Um, there are obviously many different explanations. The most popular one, um, and there is obviously a degree of truth to this, is of course uh, Min Alain, that is the uh, senior general uh, commander in chief, and now the head of the military junta, his personal ambitions, right? He obviously would not be able to become a president uh, following the 20, uh, 2019, 2020 election results, right? So it, it was, uh, a lot of people have looked at Min Alain saying, well, the Supreme Commander himself wanted to be president. And of course, there's truth to that. But as I've kind of also emphasized in my own book, that we really need to understand the logic and the, the character of the military regime in Tamada itself. Well, I think the Tamada really sees itself as the main political defender of the nation, right? And that it wants to model and create Myanmar as in an image that it perceives to, to, to be what Myanmar should be. So um, yes, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi didn't really diverge too much uh, in, in a lot of what the military was doing, but at the same time, it showed that the military did not have the type of popularity and legitimacy that it perceived that it deserves. So there are many ways to look at it. Some people believe that 
uh, perhaps Milton really bought into their own propaganda, which is that there was electoral fraud. If on the very top you have Min Online and his senior leaders getting from their uh, informants saying, oh, the military is doing fine, we're all happy. I mean, I, I believe even in Nebido, where it would be the heart of the military, they also lost uh, plenty of seats there uh, you know, from, from the electoral results, which then, one, again, it either demonstrates that genuinely that people dislike the military, which I think is pretty uh, evident that they do, perhaps not to the senior leadership of the military, but two, also, if the military recognized this result as being legitimate, then there's serious concern that they would eventually be replaced by a more genuine civilian non-military power to take over uh, you know, this disciplined democracy of their design. So I think in many ways it's to preempt that Aung San Suu Kyi and NLD to then be allowed to further uh, change the disciplined democratic design of the military. So it's, it's really more of that, in my opinion, so that, yes, their personal ambition is important, but more so that the military, despite what we see now as, you know, in a rational world, you would think, why is the military doing this, hurting its own economic interests and legitimacy? But from their perspective, I think it is to really, to ensure the continued uh, loyalty of the military, the continue you know, of the grassroots soldiers, the people in the front line, right? And to ensure that the military will still continue to prevail uh, without any real challenge of power from other power centers that, that the military can't directly control. Now, um, your second question, I think I've run a little bit and I can't exactly recall what the second question was. If you could just remind me. Mute. Okay, unmuting. Uh, yeah, since you had worked in the Drug and Crime right, Prevention right. Office of the UN, yeah. yeah, what 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 would you reflect on uh, on the uh, Burmese military's involvement in yeah, drugs just, and just crime? Quickly, uh, my own personal experience. I was uh, an intern you know, for about six months in Yangon. I did have the opportunity to go to a Wa special region, but this was also nearly two decades ago. But, uh, but I don't think much has changed, right? The military is the biggest, not just political actor, but also the biggest economic actor in the country. They are literally involved in almost any in the sector that you can imagine, right? Of course, the big one uh, is gas, um, and, and, you know, which we'll obviously talk about in a little bit, I'm sure. But also, um, it's involved in tourism, it's in, involved in um, the, the jewelry, the ruby, you know, the jade, all of these uh, industries. It's involved, of course, in retail, uh, running of hotels, uh, you know, and of course, a lot of the uh, underground economy, whether it's, um, as you've kind of implied, the underground, the, the drugs, but also arms manufacturing and, and again, um, telephone networks, pretty much everything. Um, and I think this, this, old, this change which has pre preceded, obviously, the coup, right? So this has existed really since Myanmar started kind of reforming its economy in the early 1990s, but has really grown in size. Well, the military now, um, there's often talk about how pre-opening up this economy, uh, you know, the top officials might uh, be happy with a bottle of army-made rum and you know, some uh, badminton sets, but now even kind of military captains and that have like plenty of cars and have their nice golf clubs and all this stuff. So corruption uh, has been a, a real issue and it's one of the key driving factors that has allowed the military to be united and to be loyal because for many of the military, especially of the officers class, this is their main way to achieve material wealth and as well as in their eye, a legitimacy and, and reputation because the people might not like them, but within the military, they're still respected and they still have access to power and resources. Um, well, um, we'll continue that conversation, but we have a quick break. Uh, and then right after we'll be back with Dr. Rushda Siddiqui. Um, and we've been hearing from uh, Roger Lee Wang uh, calling in from Australia, Macquarie University. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour, walk a mile in my shoes, walk a mile in my shoes. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. 
yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Yes, this is Adam Carroll back. Uh, we're talking about the one year anniversary of the military coup in Burma, how it affects uh, Burmese, how it affects uh, the region, and how it affects the Rohingya minority. Uh, so, Dr. Rushta, uh, Dr. Rushta Siddiqui is on uh, the phone here and on the screen from India, I think. Uh, please join us. Thank you so much, Dr. Carroll. And uh... I'll start off from where Dr. Li Huang had, um, you know, tried to bring in the focus on the corruption and the way the military is managing the Rohingya crisis and the entire situation in Burma. One aspect that I'd want to focus on is the kind of external support that the military junta gets, particularly from countries like India. We have a very long border with India, with uh, Myanmar. We have uh, Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, Mizoram, Manipur sharing a border. It's 1,700 kilometers long. The problems are basically economic. So you have the issue of Myanmar having the raw resources, China and India being the perfect markets, which is one of the reasons why we are seeing such a huge humanitarian crisis. I'm talking about the humanitarian crisis because I want you to understand the fact that the kind of support that the military regime is getting is because of this economic crisis. India wants to have railroads. India wants to have land connectivity. India sees China as a competitor in the economic market. India wants to uh, you know, ensure that however corrupt the military regime is, it stays in power. It's easier to negotiate there. <clears throat> With the democratic uh, regime, yes, you can have your negotiations, but it's not going to be so fruitful. If you notice, just two days back, just a few days back, actually, we had a very high level delegation going for strategic military talks. India has been supplying arms and ammunition. India has been involved in all the economic trade paths with Myanmar. The impact is the humanitarian crisis because the areas in which the population is located, be it the Chins, be it the Rohingyas, be it the Nagas, all of them need to be evacuated from that place 
and the land needs to be grabbed by both the governments so that you can go ahead with all the development tasks. Two days ago, it was uh, about one lakh families of Chins who were trying to get into India. For a year, they've been refused the entry to India on the grounds of COVID protocol. But the bigger ground remains that you do not want to upset the military government. You do not want to make it into some sort of, you know, there's democracy which has been overturned, so India should go ahead and impose sanctions or support sanctions. It's about not making sure that um, the military government in Myanmar stays happy with the Indian regime. If you look at Myanmar, look at the border states in India and the way they are managed. They all come under something called the Armed Forces Special Pass Act, where the military in India has absolute power to go ahead, do anything with the civilian population. It's no different from Myanmar, all these five border states that I've been talking about. It's no different from Myanmar when it comes under a military regime. So the mainland India is hardly affected unless you have a refugee population coming in. And if you're talking about uh, the border states, we are looking at a fermentation of infiltration of refugees, of camps, which are so-called terrorist camps being made on both sides of the border. There's a huge small arms um, exchange between these camps. And there is a lot of political instability as a result. If you notice, these five states are right now witnessing the rise of the right wing government. Arunachal, Nagaland, Mizoram, Manipur. They're witnessing the rise of a right wing government from India. The reason is just this. The very popular rhetoric of keep the infiltrators away. They are the ones who are coming to get your resources. Not realizing that the regime in Myanmar is actually focusing its violence on exactly these tribes and all these communities which are living in the border areas. That area needs to be emptied out so that, or you need to have somebody extremely friendly who will benefit from the kind of economic uh, and the kind of military strategic uh, partnerships that you can have between India and uh, Myanmar. The second thing that I want to focus on would be the role China has played. It's seen as an enemy, but somewhere along the line, it's been key in shaping India's foreign policy towards Myanmar. The fear of the Chinese stepping in, taking over, and being closer to Myanmar is what makes the India government react. Whether it was in 1962, whether it, is, it was in 1948, whether it was in 2011, whether it is in 2021, China remains a very, very important factor. And China is somebody we can never underestimate. India wants democracy in Myanmar until 2011, it was talking about supporting a democratic government in Myanmar. But at the same time, for strategic military interests, it wanted to support the military government. India has been accused of 
the being a member of uh, an observer member of the United Nations Security Council and not taking a stand. But we keep forgetting that China is part of the United Nations Security Council and it is constantly supporting the kind of uh, repression and suppression that is going on in Myanmar and in India. Nobody has taken any of the governments to task. Nobody has even questioned the existence of laws that suppress and actually make refugees out of local populations. Nobody is questioning the kind of legality that all the strategic and arms deals that are taking place are, you know, whether they're valid, whether they're not. So I'm really not sure how much time um, I have more now, but this is these are the two things that I wanted to focus on. The role that China is playing, and China is not clean, India is not clean. Myanmar, of course. The corruption in the Myanmarese regime, the corruption in China, the corruption in India, all of them combine to create a humanitarian crisis. And all of them combine to cover up the humanitarian crisis. So that there is no very large talk about it. If you look at all the rhetoric that goes around in India, it's that Rohingyas are terrorists. The Chins are infiltrators. The Chins are treated slightly better, at least when they started coming in in 1962. 2011, they were given some sort of a United Nations uh, backing. They were given identity cards. They have the right to access Indian citizenship. The Rohingyas have been denied even that. The second round of Chins who are coming in since last year, they are again going to be denied that because this time it's a proper tsunami. Well, this is uh, a, a very troubling picture of geopolitical calculation at the expense of a humane perspective or humane treatment of minority groups, and obviously they're pawns in this game. Uh, and they also have their own needs and rights. They're not only pawns, but they're being treated that way. Um, after we take a brief break, I wanted to ask not only about governments, but about businesses who are the development partners who are profiting from uh, this conflict economy. So we'll be right back with Rushta Siddiqui and Roger Lee Wang uh, just after this. Music. 